Japan, 1594. Two samurai are locked in combat with a black-clad warrior. They are about to die. Five hundred years ago, the ninja were Japan's most fearsome warriors. Their superhuman fighting skills were legendary, but were they true? How did the ninja strike fear in so many? The ninja's motto had to be kill or be killed. Yet were seen by so few. This individual was unseeable. You just never knew who was the ninja. Now we will search for the origins of the ninja. Secret societies of any sort are probably the most difficult topic that any researcher could choose. Test their elite fighting skills. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? This person has grabbed a hold of his razor-sharp sword. And discover the secrets of their mystical powers. We're just catching up to what ninja have been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Demystifying the Ninja on Unsolved History. In a large villa near downtown Los Angeles, two police officers begin their watch over an important client. As part of a real-life experiment, they have been hired to guard against a hostile attack while being monitored by remote cameras. They are expecting the worst. An attack can come at any moment. What they aren't expecting is an enemy they can't see or hear. An enemy who is one of the most deadly foes in the history of warfare. And to this day is still veiled in secrecy. The Ninja. Their feats were so amazing that they have been immortalized in countless novels and films. According to popular myth, they were masters of superhuman combat skills. One ninja could fight off ten attackers. They were renowned as assassins cloaked in black and delivering death with cold-blooded efficiency. Yet historians disagree with this premise. There isn't much evidence of many ninja assassinations being carried out. So what is the truth about the ninja? Could they fly, shape change, disappear through walls, even use the power of clairvoyance to know what an enemy might do? They can actually control their ability to see in a different place or a different time or their ability to hear what another person was thinking. It actually became a skill. It's amazing how rumors grow in the public mind so that things get exaggerated and I'm sure a lot of ninjutsu exploits are simply exaggerations of things that actually happen. How do we discern fact from fiction, especially with a group that left such scarce historical records and lived outside traditional Japanese culture? Secret societies of any sort are probably the most difficult topic that any researcher could choose. Now Unsolved History is about to demystify the ninja. We'll search the mountains of Japan for their secret origins, put their mythical superpowers to the test. We'll meet some modern-day ninjas. And our experts will investigate the true capabilities of the ninja by merging historical evidence with 21st century combat skills. Historian Dr. Stephen Turnbull. Black Belt Ninja Master Stephen Hayes. Navy SEAL instructor Michael Andrews. 13-year police veteran and security expert Bruce Cardenas. And scientist and espionage expert Dr. David Morehouse. To uncover the secrets of the ninja, we went back to their roots, to the province of Igaweno, in the mountains of central Japan. My understanding is that I've reached the heartland of the ninja. Iga Weno is where the ninja originated and is the only place on earth where there is a museum dedicated to the study of ninjutsu, which means the art of stealth, the way of invisibility. It is here that we begin our search for the truth about the ninja.
Since the ninja disappeared from Japanese culture over 140 years ago, we asked historian Stephen Turnbull to help us locate the scant records that still exist. Japan has for centuries been one of the most literate nations in the world. So much is written down, so much is preserved, particularly by families. And the stuff is there if you really can dig for it. So you say Toshina was the first person to serve as a ninja or family. Turnbull visits with Toshinobu Watanabe, who made a surprising discovery when he opened a box of family papers he found in a storage unit. But according to the documents I found, my great-grandfather was a ninja. But probably he didn't tell to his son anything about ninja. He thought that ninjutsu would be unnecessary in the new world. Mr. Watanabe shows Dr. Turnbull a written contract in which his great-grandfather pledged to never reveal what he did for his warlord employer. I've never seen anything like that before. I didn't know they existed. The fact that the guy had to sign on the dotted line shows, I suppose, the business nature of it, which implies quite a considerable organization behind the operation. And a high level of secrecy, because a description of the covert operation is never mentioned in the contract. How did ninjutsu begin in Iga province? Historians have traced its origins to Buddhist monks that emigrated from China. China was the, the major source of wisdom, of learning, of knowledge yeah. for the Japanese. For centuries, they revered Chinese traditions. Legend says that in the 11th century, a disillusioned Japanese samurai warrior met a Chinese mystic priest in the mountains of Igoeno. The priest asked the young man if he was ready to study a new form of combat that combined body and spirit and would allow him to move freely without being detected. It was called ninjutsu. He studied with this teacher and developed this whole different view, a whole different way of looking at conflict based on the understanding of the human being as a model of how nature operates. Ninjutsu began to flourish in Igoeno. The remote mountain location made it easy for the ninja to live and train in secret. They governed here by themselves, and they needed to protect themselves from being attacked by outsiders. And they had to train their bodies. The result of training was ninjutsu. At the time, Japan was composed of many independent feudal states, and war was frequent. Local warlords would hire the ninja to spy on their rivals. I think it's important to remember how unusual these skills and powers of the ninja were for the time. This isn't normal Japanese behavior. As the ninja rose to prominence during the chaos of civil war in the late 1400s, their reputation grew. Myths began to circulate about the supernatural powers they had. The most famous was invisibility. The popular term for these ninja were the invisible warriors. Well, you just never knew who was the ninja. Are they here? They just couldn't pin them down. Is there an explanation for this mystical skill? Maybe there's a night raid by um, a disgruntled warlord who wants to wipe out the ninja who've been causing him trouble. So he mounts a surprise attack on the house. The ninja designed their homes to trick their enemies into thinking they were invisible. They built concealed trap doors, false floorboards, and secret passages. These defensive measures left their enemies clueless. No enemy would be expecting that to happen. The guy would almost literally think he'd disappeared into thin air. Hence, the legend of ninja being able to disappear. One of the ninja's legendary skills was stealth walking, the ability to move silently on any surface. Stephen, can you show me some of the techniques a ninja would use on a wooden floor like this? Sure, I'll show you some of the secrets. Okay. First, take a breath and kind of relax it out, because okay. being relaxed is very important. Okay. Second, go ahead and let your knees flex this way. Sure, okay. Like a golfer, huh? Like a golfer, yeah. Now, this is a challenge, because it's a very creaky floor and we have shoes on. But here's okay. what I'm gonna have you do. First, we'll put all our weight on the, in this case, left, and okay. then just shift your right out. 
Yeah, it's excellent. Don't put any weight on it. And then slowly, slowly see if you can put the weight on there. So far, very good. I haven't heard anything. Now, pause there for a second. As you pull your foot in, bring in the breath. Uh-huh. Hold it for a second. Get yourself squared away. Now you're going to reach out with the left foot. Uh, keep your weight on your right. That's good. Even though the ninja were masters of stealth, they still had to fight sometimes. When it came to combat, the nemesis of the ninja was the samurai. These were the highly skilled warriors who served the warlords of Japan, similar to the knights of medieval Europe. All aspects of ninjutsu were contrary to the samurai method of honorable warfare. The ideal of samurai behavior was that two warriors would face squarely onto each other as worthy opponents and would fight to the death. The ninja didn't quite fit into that pattern. The ninja's definition of victory would have been to escape and not be traceable and then have the person doubt that that was a ninja in the first place so even though the samurai was a highly trained swordsman the ninja would certainly try and surprise him it was hardly the way to do business as far as the samurai was concerned but it was the ninja's motto had to be kill or be killed so what happened when the ninja and samurai clashed did the ninja's supernatural powers make the difference in battle? Get ready to learn the art of combat, ninja style, next on Unsolved History. For hundreds of years, Japan's warrior culture was embodied by the strong and powerful samurai. These swordsmen were the elite fighting class of Japan, until the ninja came along. I think the ninja would have been regarded with terror. These are people that you have to be very, very careful dealing with. There are myths that a ninja could easily defeat the samurai in combat, even when outnumbered. But are they true? The samurai would be trying to figure out these maybe odd movements that the uh, ninja would be using. Different kind of tools, different positioning with the body. Plus, in his mind, he would have all of these memories of warnings from other people. Hey, these people might throw some kind of uh, poisoned iron filings into your eyes. Stephen Hayes has practiced ninja combat arts for over 30 years and is a member of the Black Belt Hall of Fame. He has pioneered the introduction of ninjutsu to the Western world. We asked him to help us understand what kind of special powers the ninja really had and how they used them in combat. The ninja were sent to be able to defy gravity and scale a sheer rock wall. But they had a special trick. These are the ninja's shuko. It's a popularly referred to as a climbing claw. It's a steel band with these very tough, strong claws. And so these points were able to wedge in and allow a ninja to climb up that castle wall. The shuko had another purpose. If a person had climbed up a wall and ran into some sort of a guard, this could be used as a combat tool as well. In darkness, they might not even see this metal band. So to be able to hit into bone uh, with this metal band or, or catch an arm with these claws. Very persuasive. To the samurai, it would appear that his ninja opponent was unarmed. This scenario. He comes flying in with that sword. Immediately he came in with a second shot. It was better than I thought, so I had to get out of there. As he comes in with this next shot, I'm just gonna come in and gain control of his arms, digging this in. But if he's a samurai, he might have been armored. He lifts his arm up and starts to cut down. I'm gonna jam this right in there. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? This person has grabbed a hold of his razor sharp sword. So I use that for just that moment of tension. I lift up, kick, load, and knock his hips back so that I can then redirect his energy here. Kicking, getting him off, and then safely holding this sword, I can go in for a vulnerable area. A ninja would only survive if he could fight his way out of a hostile confrontation. To do that, he needed special weapons and tactics. In terms of taking the simple handheld weapon to its perfection, I think that's where the ninja get a great deal of credit. First and foremost, the ninja's weaponry had to be both compact and portable. 
the ninja would have had to carry all his weapons about his person. So he wouldn't want to be encumbered by too much gear when he got to climb into a castle or carry out an assassination getaway. The ninja developed their exotic weaponry from the agricultural implements they used to tend their farms in the flatlands of Igoweno. The classic example being the sickle and the chain. Uh, the sickle is a simple farmer's tool, but with a very sharp blade and a whole series of martial techniques of martial arts uh, developed whereby a sickle could be wielded as, as well as a sword. By using the sickle with a length of chain connected to a ball weight at the end, the ninja kept the samurai off guard. It was an unconventional weapon the samurai had never seen before. I would imagine that uh, the first time a samurai saw a, a ninja wielding a chain, he must have thought, this is very strange, what do I do with it? Hence, um, the ninja had him at his mercy. The ninja also designed a more compact version of the ball and chain. It could overpower a swordsman in close quarters. You can only imagine the effect of this weight flying out and hitting right between the eyes. Uh, might even have an instant knockout. When it came to sword fighting, the ninja used a shorter sword, which was more maneuverable in tight quarters. The traditional samurai sword of the age is a, a much longer blade because this would have been for an outdoor battlefield type of battle. The short sword gave the ninja an advantage even when he was outnumbered. In this scenario, I want them to think that I have that reach. So I pull this blade up and I keep it very flat so he can't see how long it is. He attacks to just knock this and me out of the way. I'm gonna get really low here, all right? From there, as he starts to come back in, I'm gonna jump and hit using my body weight to take him all the way down to the ground. From this very exposed or awkward position, as this attacker comes in here, I use my body to throw the sword across. As he cuts down, I let him think I'm vulnerable, and then simply by throwing that arm up, it'll cut through the wrist there. I can move the sword handle out, and then because of the adrenaline, there's no fine muscle control left at this point, so I just put it where it needs to be, and then by pulling, I'll be able to finish off that attacker and then get out of there. Unlike the samurai, the ninja also trained women in the combat arts. Rumiko Hayes has studied ninjutsu for over 20 years and has mastered many of the same skills as her husband, Stephen. By uh, doing this for so many years with all different peoples, I can kind of foresee what kind of attack it's going to be. Just by their body positioning, and then I just became so in tune with their, their body movement, their body posture, just a slight difference makes me realize or makes me let me know that okay he's gonna do this according to practitioners the ninja not only mastered exotic weapons but they learned how to read an attacker's mind this skill went far beyond conventional warfare what we do is we pay very close attention to the senses so I look and I watch for somebody who carries their shoulders a little too stiffly or maybe their eye comes to mind but then kind of goes away. Hayes has set up a demonstration in which he has to sense where an attack is coming from. How do I feel? Am I tending to walk over this way when I get around this person? I've got to be more in touch with my senses, my, my feelings. Hey, good, good. Oh, oh, the ninja had to develop sophisticated warrior skills because they were operating under such extreme conditions. The price of failure was death. Can you imagine that kind of stress or kind of pressure that no normal person would feel? What if I'm caught? I might betray my family, I might uh, fail my uh, mission, I might betray myself. That kind of uh, constant stress would be very different from a conventional soldier of the time. Here we have people who are utterly devoted to their calling. They are the experts, they are the elite, and like special forces nowadays, failure is just not taken into account. But how good were the ninja? Can their techniques stand the test of time? Get ready to experience a modern-day ninja mission that puts both mind and body to the test. 
on Unsolved History. What happened to the ninja? Today, they no longer exist. But for 400 years, they were a powerful force in Japanese society. If you could destroy the enemy by sowing confusion in his ranks, by finding information out that he didn't want you to know, or even by assassinating the general while he was in his castle, then you'd won the battle just as surely as if you'd sent thousands of men to fight each other on a bloody field. With this kind of clout, many of the Japanese shoguns dreaded the ninja and tried to destroy them. But in 1603, Ieyasu Tokugawa became shogun. He chose a radically different approach to relations with the ninja. Instead of trying to eliminate him, he offered him a job. They were told they would become noble bushi warriors. So from then on, they would work for him and for nobody else. Absolutely brilliant. The ninja became personal bodyguards for Tokugawa. To keep their mission veiled in secrecy, they assumed the role of palace gardeners. This may seem a little surprising, but I can't think of any better disguise for a ninja than to be a gardener. So the shogun had all of these ninja constantly around his house, looking busy, you know, cleaning up, doing things, but if anything happened, they could actually go into action to defend. No attacking enemy would, would suspect this um, poor gentleman there with a pair of pruning shears being a skilled ninja until the pruning shears became a deadly weapon. Using the ninja's vast spy network, the Tokugawa regime was able to bring peace and civil order to Japan. So Ieyasu Tokugawa was the shogun who pacified the ninja and took them out of their role as a very dangerous wild card in Japanese military political history. In 1868, Japan entered the modern age, causing huge convulsions to Japanese society. The samurai were transformed into a Western-style army, and because of domestic peace, the ninja were no longer necessary. They disappeared from the scene. Or did they? The ninja stopped operating in Japan nearly 140 years ago, yet many of their techniques are still in use today. The ninja were ahead of their time. If there's any analogy we can draw with today, to be to look at them as equivalent to special forces of SAS, of Navy SEAL. In many ways, today's special forces look and operate the way the ninja did. But are the ninja's techniques still relevant? Could the ninja still function in today's world of high-tech espionage and state-of-the-art weaponry? Unsolved History decided to find out. We rented a villa similar to a shogun's palace and set up a safe house on the top floor. Next, we hired a security expert who has protected hundreds of celebrities and executives. Bruce Cardenas. Bruce's partner is Demetrius Connor. Both are LAPD veterans and will guard the target, a VIP inside the safe house. The test, can an intruder penetrate the safe house, get past the guards, and kill the VIP? To compare techniques, we asked Stephen Hayes and a team of Navy SEALs to attempt the mission. The leader of the Navy SEALs is Mike Andrews, a 10-year veteran who served in Desert Storm and was also an instructor. Well, in any sort of operation like this, anything is possible, but because of the repetition, as far as our practice and our skill level, we feel that we are the best trained and we will achieve our mission. To create a realistic environment, Unsolved History wired a five-room area inside the safe house with ten remote cameras. This will be the hot zone, where no outsiders are allowed, not even the camera crew. Before the mission can begin, Daniel briefs Bruce and Demetrius about the rules. Your mission is to defend him from any threat. You've been armed with weapons. The weapons are lasers. If either an attacker or defender is tagged by a laser, he is considered out of the mission. Now you're the target, and you'll know you've been had when they take your hat off. And that's the end of the game. Okay. Okay. Daniel walks the guards through the hot zone. There is only one entrance, which leads to a narrow hallway. He explains that anyone who enters this area should be considered hostile. Can we use any barricades or move any furniture? 
No, you can't move the furniture or, the, or barricade yourself in. So you look at the rooms, you decide what the advantage is. Bruce and Demetrius are told to expect a number of different attacks that could come in any form over a 10 hour period. Gentlemen, it's time for you to go into the area and this area is now hot. Ready? Yeah. Come on, let's go. The defenders decide to put their client in the bathroom near the back of the house. They are preparing for a gunfight, so they pick a location that offers them cover and safety. Put the toilet seat down. Okay. Downstairs, technical director Cole Berry monitors the defenders and asks them trivia questions. Your trivia question, Dimitri, is who is the Lucy? And the Lucy's firing. Go find the answer. Roger, step up. The trivia quiz will require the defenders to move throughout the hot zone and find a reference book that tells them the answer. That way, they can't just sit in one spot waiting for the attack. This will simulate the daily routine that bodyguards undergo as they spend months and even years on the job. We've equipped them with helmet cameras so we can watch their every move. As the defenders get oriented inside the safe house, the SEALs begin their operation. They deploy a sniper to survey the house. He uses a tried and true ninja technique, camouflage. The art of camouflage is all about tricking the eye. The ghillie suits to break up the person's silhouette. Somebody can pick up the silhouette of a body. I mean, there's nothing else in the world that looks like it but a body. Meanwhile, the SEAL assault team prepares for the attack. Mission like this, we're gonna wear dark colored outfits, uh, masks, so that we uh, blend in and uh, we're stealthy and we're matching the dimly lit conditions of the target. Although the guards are performing their tasks, they are still vigilant, expecting an attack at any moment. Outside, the sniper determines the position of the target using a high-powered rifle scope. We'll keep feeding the team, hey, you know, every 10 minutes I see this guy walk by the window. They just move the guy. When the sniper reports the location of the target, the attack team of five SEALs moves into position. We have intel that they have pre-ordered rounds that they make around the premises, and we're going to ambush one of their security element there. The attack lasts less than 20 seconds. Lock it down. First, Bruce is ambushed by three separate seals. He barely gets his gun out of the holster. I think I heard them the same time I saw them. It was simultaneously. When the shooting starts, the seals have to be quick because unlike Bruce, Demetrius is ready for them. I knew they had to come down this corridor here. And as they were coming, I began firing. And I think I saw one of them go past. I moved over here because I knew he was going to come out through here. So I took a position here and just started firing in this manner. Demetrius's handgun is no match for the seals' automatic weapons. Came in. I saw a movement here to the right. I saw his gun sticking out behind the doorway, so I just stitched him right up. The SEALs made short of the guards using size and overwhelming firepower to get to their target. But how would a ninja fare? Would he be able to get past the guards? Next on Unsolved History, a modern-day ninja attempts to penetrate the hot zone. By going in without any overt weapons uh, actually allowed me to move right into the middle of all that danger. And we investigate the most extraordinary ninja power. They can actually control their ability to see in a different place or a different time. In our safe house experiment, the Navy SEALs were easily able to overpower the guards by using massive firepower and the element of surprise. But how well would a ninja do? Stephen Hayes, a modern day ninja, will attempt to use ninjutsu to accomplish the same mission, assassinate the target. After the SEAL attack, the guards, Bruce and Demetrius, decide to move their client to the other side of the safe house. They are determined not to fail a second time. But Hayes plans on using a completely different strategy than the SEALs. What I wanted to do was 
go in with minimum backup. Little intelligence. I went in with no weapon. I had no uh, big team to go in. Here, the myth of the ninja diverges from the reality. The myth. A ninja assassin dressed in black, slipping furtively through the shadows to reach his goal. The reality. The ninja was more likely to use deception to slip past the guards. 500 years ago, the ninja would often use disguises like that of a gardener. Our modern-day ninja will adopt a contemporary guise. He will pretend to be a production assistant working with the television crew. The real thing is we look like what people expect to see and therefore we go invisible. I had a can of air that I was using to appear to be cleaning off some lenses there. Hayes begins to carefully probe the perimeter of the hot zone. Parker, we have somebody up here. Dimitri, we got people up here. Can I help you, sir? Just, we're setting a camera up here. You know, I'm not to send you away. No one announced you. But Bruce isn't fooled by the ploy and won't let him pass the front hall. So how, how did that go? He came out gun drawn and uh, confronted me in there, so uh, they're real jumpy. Even with the defenders suspicious, Hayes won't give up his strategy. I had recruited a young woman to assist me in just kind of wearing them down. I would send her in, smiling, the tool belt on, offering drinks. This doesn't look like a danger. Hello there. Can I help you? Guys, I brought you some donuts. Why, why don't anyone announce you guys? Pardon? You know, I'm about to send you away. No one announced you. Okay. Should I leave them on the ground? No, you can take it back. Okay. They got to see people who they knew weren't supposed to be here were confusing the issue. What the f man? Why are they doing this? It's a booby trap, man. Get yeah. her out of here. So I used her to help wear them down. I mean, if I come up here again. It's now 3.20 in the afternoon. The defenders have been in the safe house just over three hours. With the repetitive tasks and no apparent threat, boredom is beginning to set in. Yeah, you may have to call down. Stephen Hayes decides it's time to test the guards again. Demetrius, what's this? The police SWAT people, they were so good, they were so observant. My role in order to get through their defenses was to be slightly bumbling, slightly frustrated. I'm this harmless person. Can I help you, sir? Ah, uh, these foggers are clogging up our little lenses. All right. I'm just spraying here. I don't know why they're not announcing you. They didn't? No, no. Okay. You need to get out of this area. Yeah. Is it okay if I just get that one one spray right there? By 10, by 10 right, seconds. Back wall. Go ahead. Okay. That time we came out and they told me I needed to leave. And I said, oh, I, could you give me like 10 more seconds to do one more of these cameras? He gave a little smile and I said, okay, but I'm going to keep you covered. And he backed on down the hall. So it was a little calmer than before. I don't know why they keep doing that. Is that the whole utility belt? Like he's a grip or something? As the afternoon wears on, we keep the guards busy with more trivia questions. Bruce, you seem to be the genius. What is a garand? So repeat the question. Is a garand? But Bruce is interrupted as he looks up the answer. Guys, what do you oh, These foggers are driving us crazy. We need to go into this wing and spray these Pelcos. This is too much smoke. So why does the fog screw up the lens? I mean, it's not, it's not a moist fog. It's got that film on there. All right, go ahead. I just acted like this kind of an individual who really had no idea how dangerous it was would have acted. And they assumed I was supposed to be there because I acted like I was supposed to be there. One officer was trying to figure out what grand was, so. I grinned and I said, cover your mic. Huh? Cover your mic. Isn't that grand? And he covered his mic and said, it's a rifle. And just gave him a thumbs up. And so I gave him the answer like I was his buddy and was going to help him cheat. But the answer to that question is? Is it, is it a long rifle? Correct. The correct answer earns Bruce's confidence, giving Hayes free reign inside the hot zone. He decides to probe closer to the target. That's the one in the window? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really thought they might 
take the protectee out and then let us go down. But he was down there. So we went down, we walked in, I went back to the camera near where the protectee was hiding, and I was spraying it, and uh, one officer was right in the door. You know, how am I going to get past this guy without physical contact? So I started acting annoyed. Page. Page. So now they're kind of looking at each other. And, and they're saying, ah. It took Hayes over four hours to wear down the guards and successfully reach the target. What I enjoyed about this assigned mission was it was an opportunity to really show people how the ninja would operate. By going in without any overt weapons uh, actually allowed me to move right into the middle of all that danger. Is it okay if I just get that one one spray right there? I got duped by him. I mean, it was believable that he was uh, uh, the maintenance guy. I screwed up. I, I should have held our ground and it was a hot set and you said there was no exceptions except for uh, the two referees, so. Hayes has completed his mission. His success proves that the ninja's ancient techniques are still viable in today's high-tech world. But what about the most unbelievable skill of a ninja? Are they really capable of reading minds or is this just a myth? Next on Unsolved History. Our tests have shown that ninja were far ahead of their time and that their mythical superpowers are in reality a product of sophisticated weapons technology coupled with superbly conceived training and practice. I doubt if there was any other organization on the face of the earth as efficient as the ninja for the particular skills that they had. But there is one skill that is still up for debate. Clairvoyance. One of the aspects of this ninja mind lore that I really uh, enjoyed exploring is the ability to see in some completely different place or time, like what we would call remote viewing. This was a very serious part of that old ninja training. Did the ninja really possess this supernatural skill? And if they did, how can we test such an unbelievable power? To answer that question, we turn to the CIA. The CIA spent six years developing and spending an endowment of somewhere around $50 million testing, evaluating remote viewing. And they continue to use it today. According to declassified reports, during the Cold War, the CIA used remote viewers to try to locate Russian nuclear weapons and other military targets. David Morehouse was an operational remote viewer for an army intelligence cell that worked for the CIA. We asked Morehouse to set up a remote viewing experiment where he applied the CIA method to ninjutsu. If you're comparing remote viewers to ninja, well, the great similarity that is there certainly is this absolute knowing that there is something beyond the physical that is inherent to all of us. Uh, the ninja knows that. The same is true of a remote viewer. They come in with a fundamental core knowledge that they have this ability. On the same day we ran our safe house assault experiment, Morehouse assembled a group of remote viewers in a hotel conference room, nine miles away. So while Stephen Hayes and the Navy SEALs were attacking the target, Morehouse was running his own experiment with the remote viewers. Their task? Pinpoint the location of the target inside the safe house, and then provide a detailed physical description of both. That this target is going to be pushed or placed in a stationary location, somewhere in the structure, top or bottom. You have to find that out. Morehouse shows them only an outline of the building, so they have no idea what it looks like or who's inside. They aren't given photographs of the site. They're not allowed to walk on the site. We don't tell them about what really is happening there. We uh, keep it very narrow in its focus, and we give them an opportunity to go into an altered state of consciousness, and they begin to extract data. The remote viewers begin by blocking out all external stimuli. The experiment must take place during the ninja and seal attacks, so the target will experience real fears and emotions. According to Morehouse, the biological activity in the target's brain can be picked up by the viewers. The target is putting off an electrochemical response. It's putting off a frequency response. Its thoughts, the actions and motions of its body, 
the physiology of the body, everything there is producing a waveform expression of what is taking place. And these individuals are able to detect and decode that data, sketching it and capturing verbally what they are perceiving. After three hours, the remote viewers end their session and record their findings. Then they go to the safe house to see how close they came to locating the target. See the fence? Lots of fence. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm really satisfied with what they've done. The larger majority of the remote viewers, 10 out of 11, indicate that it's on the top floor. When we evaluated the results, five out of the 11 viewers came within 15 yards of hitting the target, while one was spot on. The viewers were only 50% successful in locating the target, yet there were other more compelling results. 100% of them indicated that it was a male target. Most all of them, probably three quarters of them, indicated that it was a target with dark hair. Over 50% of them indicated that the target had some form of facial hair, uh, either a beard or a mustache. The viewers also did a number of sketches, which remarkably depict some of the features of the safe house. Here you have uh, the sketches, and it's shown in one, two, three pillars. There are two pillars there, and then it kind of disappears here, but you can see they're the same. Then you have this crisscross grate, and then there's the crisscross grates there. The viewers were able to capture such details as a wrought iron entryway with chain link above it, ornate tile patterns, high curved ceilings, and a large curved staircase, all without ever having seen the house. This phenomenon seems to fly in the face of conventional science. Can there be a rational explanation? I've had an opportunity to take part in some of the modern day experiments or tests in remote viewing. And I found that uh, the people who are most well known tend to do the same thing that was taught in those old ninja methods. I personally don't think they had any form of sixth sense whatsoever because I don't think it exists. The notion that the ninja had particular psychic powers uh, was one of the myths that they encouraged to make people more frightened of them. So what is the truth about these powers? Are they myth or reality? While some of the mystical powers of the ninja can't be explained, our tests have shown that these invisible warriors were far ahead of their time. They achieved their supernatural skills by blending the mysticism of Far Eastern religion with practical training and sophisticated weapons technology. No matter if one believes the myth or the reality, it is still a very powerful mix. The greatest warriors have not been the most brawny. They have been the most cunning, the most aware, the most capable of thinking and being in the battlefield. The ninja may no longer exist, but their warrior skills live on.